Thank you so very much, Dan. Thank you, worship team. It's been powerful, the singing. Uh, we are really, really blessed. And thank you also, Dan, for leading the service today. And today we uh, continue with the theme vision. And we are looking at the year of the Lord's overcoming strength. The year of the Lord's overcoming strength. And the title of today's message is Waiting for the Promise. Waiting for the Promise. And uh, the question I'd like to ask is, have you ever been given a promise? Have you ever waited for a promise? As a child, I remember uh, relocating from the countryside to come to the city. And I'd be, we had been given a promise that we'll come to the city. And I was very excited. And I was counting as the days were drawing near. And the night came before the morning when we were to leave, early in the morning. And I slept very early because I was excited. Because there was a promise that I had been given. We are relocating to the city. And as I was sleeping in the night, I would toss and turn. I would wake up so many times and I realize it's still dark. I was waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. And today, and finally, of course, we came to the city and the rest is history. But we are, today we are going to look at waiting for the promise. But this time not waiting from the promise from man, but waiting for the promise from the Father. And as we look at this, we are going to look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, as we explore together about this promise. And so Luke records, uh, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. So John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. You shall, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. As we take time exploring, waiting from the, for the promise, may we understand what it means to wait for the promise and what we need to do as we are waiting for the promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Waiting for the promise. Waiting for the promise. Maybe we can visit the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. 
And we need to look a little bit about what he also had to say. He's the same writer, really. And let's look at also what he had to say in the Gospel of Luke. And we find, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He, then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Our theme vision for this year is a year of the Lord's overcoming strength. And the scripture passage is Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 31. And it tells us, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we find that there are those who wait upon the Lord. There's something about waiting upon the Lord. And as we are looking together, I want us to look at Luke 24, 45 for a minute. And we find, we are being told here that he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. It's possible to hear the same message. Possible to be in the same service. Possible to listen to the same teaching. But if your understanding is not opened, then you will not comprehend what the Spirit is saying. Isaiah 6, 9 tells us a little more about that. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Let's take a close look at that. And he said, this is about when Isaiah was called to be a prophet. And he said, he, and verse 9 says, and he said, go and tell these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. It's possible to hear and not to understand. Keep on seeing, but not perceiving. It's possible to see and not to perceive. Verse 10 tells us something. Make the heart of these people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. There is a need for someone's heart. Let's continue looking at that passage. There's a need for someone's heart to be quickened and for their ears to be light and not heavy. And that when they open their eyes, they can perceive. For when they do perceive and when their hearts are opened, they can comprehend and understand. Then they will return and be healed. This is a year when we need not only to hear with our ears, we need our hearts to be opened and our ears and understanding that we may comprehend what the Spirit of God is saying. For this is a year when God wants to grant us new strength, overcoming strength. Last year there was distress. Last year there was pressure. Last year there was pain. But God is telling us, yes, you've been through a distress, but I want to give you an overcoming spirit. And so we need to, not only to hear, but to also understand what the Spirit is saying. And that's why within a service like this, because when you share a vision, we cast a vision. When you cast a vision, you cannot teach a vision. A vision is caught by the one who is waiting upon the Lord. Praise Jesus. So if you're waiting upon the Lord, I want to tell you, this is your message. It's a year of the Lord's overcoming strength. We noticed last Sunday as we were sharing that uh, when you're talking about the letter, the letter 20 from the Hebrew, we find 
uh, it speaks of about calf, which means redemption, speaks to redemption. As in interpretation, no wonder last year it was a year of the Lord's redemptive establishment. But when now you add one which is a left, we find it speaks to strength. It speaks to strength, especially after a distress. Strength, especially after a trying time. And last Sunday, remember when we were looking at this together, we looked at Jacob and how he had 21 on the 21st year. Is how later on now he left his uncle Urban and he went back to his family. And we find how he experienced, he had a moment with God, you know, when he wrestled with the angel. And again, after another 21 years, a time of distress, missing his son, on the 21st year, something happened. What happened? He actually, this time, his son had left at age 18. At 21 years later, Joseph, at age 29, 39, he met again with the father. We find God had encouraged him. God gave him strength. Hallelujah. And the Lord is going to give us overcoming strength. And so as we look at this passage together, we are observing something in verse 49. We are finding in Luke verses 49, we are finding something very interesting here. He said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. The promise was from the father. God the father is the one who gave the promise. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. Jesus sends the promise, the Holy Spirit. But God himself, the Father, promised that he would be coming. But Jesus Christ, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is the one who sent the promise. Waiting on the promise. There's a hymn we liked singing some years ago. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. There's a peace and rest we find when we know how to wait on God. Now, Jesus sends the promise, the Holy Spirit, but he told them to wait. There is a place for waiting. Last Sunday we observed that waiting is not idling. When you're waiting, you're doing something. And praying is one of the most important things you can do when you're waiting on God, when you're waiting on the Lord. Today we are going to find out when you're waiting on the Holy Spirit, when you're waiting on the promise, what is expected of you. And then he told them, until you're endued. What does it mean to be endued? To be endued means to be surrounded. To be encompassed, to be enclosed, to be clothed, to be transfused. Like we talk about blood transfusion. And so we find that when you are endued until you are endued with power from on high. We need in this season, we need in this year to be endued with power from on high. For on our own we cannot make it. With our ability, we cannot make it. We need power from on high. And we need to learn to wait on the promise. There's a principle I'd like you to remember. There is no promise without a relationship and a fellowship. There is no promise without a relationship and a fellowship. When I was young, I think I've shared this before, on my 12th birthday, I will never forget. There was, you know, as little kids, we love music. And I love music too. And um, one of the birthdays, on my 12th birthday, one of my aunties came visiting. And uh, it was my birthday. And we were sitting at home and we were celebrating. And she made a promise. She said, Ben, I'm going to buy you a flute. A nice, shiny flute. And she told me, I'll bring it to you. Because, on, because this is your birthday, I promise. And I was very excited as 12-year-olds get excited. And I started seeing myself playing the flute very nicely. I would have dreams of me playing the flute and impressing all the other boys in school that I'm better than you, I can play the flute. Of course, when you're little, you're trying to prove something to everyone. And one day went by, and the month went by, and the year went by. Well, I hit my 20s, I hammered my 30s, well, I'm crowning my 40s, and the flute has never come. I have never forgotten the promise. 
to date. I even remember the auntie who gave that promise. Hallelujah. So I cannot play a flute because a promise was not kept. That was my last ambition of being musical. Hallelujah. But God is a promise giver and God is a promise keeper. He gave the promise. The Father was the one who gave that promise. It's a promise of my Father that Jesus tells us. But Jesus sent him for us to have him with us. There is no promise without a relationship or a fellowship. So maybe you're here and you're listening. The question I want to ask you, do you have fellowship with the promise giver? I like giving this story about a father and a son. And the son and the father were very close to one another. They had a very deep connection. But then the son started walking out of the will of the father. He started sinning and committing crime. And he displeased his father. And they were no longer in talking terms. And the devil would tell the son, well, this is not your father. You have no relationship with him because of what you have done. So the father kept, son kept going farther and farther away from his father. Until one day, he got a revelation that my father will remain my father wherever I go. I have his DNA. But I don't have the right fellowship with my father. And so he, come back, he came back to his father and he told the father, I repent of my sins. I repent of the wrongs I've done against you. And from today henceforth, I have purpose to change. The father embraced the son and told him, welcome back. I've always desired that we reconnect in fellowship. And that's exactly the same thing with us. We are created in the image and likeness of God. And God, the promise giver, God, the one who created the universe, is the same God who gave the promise. And that promise was God, the Holy Spirit. And we find that when we come back to God, when we return to him, he will return to us. When we go to him, he will come to us. God is in the business of seeking us. While we are lost in sin, God is busy seeking us. Actually, we are not the ones who seek God. God has been seeking us continually. It's only when we turn and look at the love he has for us and we realize, wait a minute, my loving father is telling me, come, let us have a restoration of the fellowship. Christ came to restore my fellowship with God. Christ came to restore your fellowship with God. Just like the young man realized he could not lose his relationship. He had lost his fellowship. You cannot lose your place in being a creation of God and loved of God. But your fellowship with him, once it's broken, then there's a problem. And you cannot receive the promise unless you have a growing, in growing fellowship with him. And so if you're right there at home, I want to take note of that before we finish this service. You may still make that commitment and come and restore your fellowship with God. For that's why Christ came. In Acts 1 verse 4, we are told that Jesus commanded them. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So they were told to wait for the promise. And it was a command. It was a command for them to wait. Hosea 4, 6 reminds us, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In fact, at this time, you may be asking yourself, what are we talking about here? See, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. God is calling out for a restoration of fellowship right there. I came across a saying some time back that I find very interesting by Malcolm X. He once said, if you want to hide something from black people, put it in a book. That's what he said. Now, waiting on the Holy Spirit, you wait on him in discipleship, in the word of God, that he may then reveal to you what the word of God is saying, that you may have a heart of understanding. Then you will not be destroyed. We only wait on him 
in the word. You must in the word of God. That is where we wait on him. Otherwise, if we don't wait on him in the word of God, last Sunday we talked about waiting upon the Lord in prayer. Now you have to wait upon the Holy Spirit in the word. When you're waiting on him in the word, when you're deep in discipleship, when you're deep in the Bible study, when you're deep in relating with what the word of God is telling you, then he comes and he illuminates the word and it then has meaning and you understand what the will and purpose of God is. See, zeal without knowledge is very dangerous. We need to be grounded, immersed in the word. There we are waiting, because as we are waiting in the word, then the Holy Spirit comes and he gives us understanding. Friends, we need to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm just giving a highlight. We'll be digging deeper in the course of the year. We'll go quite deep indeed. You see, Christ came to reveal to us the Father. The Holy Spirit came to reveal to us Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we experience the Godhead. The study of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology big word in Greek. Well, it simply means, pneuma simply means breath or spirit. See, the Holy Spirit breathes life to logos, that is the word, and it comes to life, we connect and relate. The word alone, without the Holy Spirit opening our hearts and minds to give us understanding, it can be very dry. Without the Holy Spirit, the word is very dry and difficult to understand. You see, friends, there are two extremes in understanding God the Holy Spirit. One is very little known, almost ignored. The other side of the coin is over-familiar and thinking. Some people think they know him too much, so they are overly familiar with the move of God the Holy Spirit. Now, both extremes are not healthy. You see, friends, I want to tell you today, this is a very important principle I'd like you to remember. Your success or failure as a Christian is heavily hinged on your knowledge, relationship, and obedience or disobedience to the Holy Spirit. Your success as a Christian or failure as a Christian is hinged on your knowledge, relationship, and obedience or disobedience of God the Holy Spirit. They were told to wait. And you wait for the promise, the Holy Spirit, to give you understanding while you're immersed in the word of God. Paul had spoken a little about that. He mentioned that we did not come to you only in words, but also with deeds and signs. We live in a time where there's a dichotomy of the three. You find that some are so focused on the word. And word is given attention, which is a beautiful thing. And at one point, knowledge puffs up. Because if it's only knowledge, without works and without signs, it's incomplete gospel. Some have an overemphasis on works. Excellent work ethic. Excellent performance. Excellent delivery. Excellent social involvement. But if you simply have works without a foundation of the word and without signs, that's an incomplete gospel. On the other extreme, we have those who are so carried away by signs, wonders, and miracles. Every day is a miracle day, and every day is which miracle are you chasing? I call them miracle chasers. Today they are chasing this, tomorrow they are chasing that. And there's nothing wrong with signs. Signs are important. Miracles are important. But if they're not founded in the word, and there's no proper theology of work, if the work ethic is not right, then there is a problem. But we are here to declare to you the whole gospel. Which is this whole gospel? One, the word. Hallelujah. The word of God in spirit and truth and power that we may understand the purposes of God. But wait a minute. We also want to have a relevance on the work ethic. Work ethic that testifies that Christ is our Lord and our master. But thirdly, signs and wonders have to follow. That's a complete gospel. So we will focus on a complete gospel. So when you're waiting for the promise, we are, we are acknowledging the working of God, the Holy Spirit. He is still at work in our midst if you allow him. In fact, if you look at verses 5, Acts 1.5, what are we told? Acts 1.5 tells us the following. For John 
truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Baptism with water is very important. Why? It's an act of obedience. It symbolizes the believer's faith in the crucified Christ. In fact, buried and risen with the Savior, the believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in newness and life in Christ. It's a testimony to the believer's faith in the final resurrection of the dead. The power of water baptism. Very important indeed. But let me tell you, friends, we also told about something else. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And this baptism is equally important. Baptism with the Holy Spirit is an empowering experience. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And why? Because for the equipping, of, for the equipping Spirit-filled believers for witness and ministry, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit for works of ministry. Hallelujah. We are empowered that we may have works of ministry. But how can we be empowered? We need to be immersed in the word of God. And the Holy Spirit reveals to us the purpose and the will of Jesus Christ and the will of God the Father. We need to learn to wait at the feet of Christ, immersed in the word. Malcolm X, when he said, if you don't hide anything from a black person, hide it in a book. Explains why we've been told that Africa uh, is miles wide, you know, an inch deep. Where miles wide talks about it, we are so evangelized, but you're only an inch deep in discipleship. Which explains why sometimes you're so easily cheated. A new doctrine comes up and people follow because not of having a Berean attitude. Yet we are reminded today, if we learn to wait on the Holy Spirit, when you're taking time in the Word, and you're taking time in the study, and we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the whole will and purpose of God, He will illuminate the Word of God, and will have a meaning and purpose, and will not only be understanding, but will also be relevant. One has to seek through prayer that the Holy Spirit may give of the spiritual gifts. Of course, we'll talk later about spiritual gifts as we did some time back. The gifts have to exercise, are exercised to build up the church. Friends, if we look at Joel 2, 28 to 32, let's go there for a minute. As we explore briefly the prophecy, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on men servants and on my, on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And then it continues on and on. And so we actually find that God promised to give us the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you, friends, there is no success without God the Holy Spirit being in you. There is no victory as a Christ in your Christian life without the move and power of God the Holy Spirit. So you need to have a very deep connection with him, a very deep relationship with him. So waiting in the Lord, waiting in the word, in discipleship, the Holy Spirit makes the truth of Scripture a reality in our lives. I want to give an example and then we pray. You see, power is generated like here by Kenyan and other power producers. And then Kenya power then does the supplying of this power. But then if you have a home and you're connected, you have this power in your home. But then you still have to do a switch on so that you can then experience the power that's already been produced. I'm here to maybe give a parallel and say, our Heavenly Father is all-powerful. He has all the power. Actually, so much power because he's an all-powerful God. But then he gave us Jesus Christ who revealed to us the will of the Father. But we find that while that happened, for us then to connect, we need the Holy Spirit. To connect and be sensitive so that we are switched on to the will of God as we connect with the leading of God the Holy Spirit. And so there are many Christians walking today full of power and the demons can see them. They have the knowledge of the word. Hallelujah. Maybe they're even walking in the works, but there are no signs. 
There is no evidence of the power of God in them. The devil knows they have the power, but he's happy they have an ignorance of God the Holy Spirit. They may have a philosophy saying, well, this can't happen now. It happened then. And that philosophy blocks them from experiencing the manifold power of God through the Holy Spirit. We need to be switched on. Just as you switch on the power and then you experience all the lighting you need and all the equipment that you have needing to be powered. The power of God is expressed in us through the Holy Spirit of God who then has to baptize us. Hallelujah. We need the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, in 2021. The experience of the Godhead becomes a reality when the Holy Spirit of God is not only in us, but expresses the will of God in us. Ma then Mark 16, 17 to 18 becomes a reality. One of my favorite passages in scripture. And these signs will follow those who believe. Hallelujah. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. God is a God of the word. God is a God who wants us to have actions and deeds, but God is also a God of signs. And for this to happen, we have to know to wait on the promise, and that is the Holy Spirit. And how do we do that? By being immersed in the word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to learn to wait on the Holy Spirit to reveal to us your purpose as we are immersed in your word. Lord, help us to connect in discipleship. Help us to connect on personal devotion. Help us to connect in prayer. That we may not be carrying all this power of God in us, but it's never expressed because we have refused to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us. We repent of ignorance that we may have had, dear Lord. We repent of times we've not obeyed you by taking time in your word. Give us the wisdom and the diligence to be grounded in you. That we will be given understanding just as Jesus gave understanding to his disciples and then they were able to comprehend what you, the, what you are saying to them. Now with all eyes closed, maybe you're there and you're saying, I want my fellowship to be restored with God. Just raise your hand wherever you are. And say this prayer after me, dear Jesus. In this new year, I come before you. I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior. Make me a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Come into my life. Baptize me today. Reveal to me the will of God, the Father. Reveal to me the will of Jesus Christ, that I may walk in the will and purpose of the living God. Thank you for giving me a new life. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And maybe you're there and you've never been connecting in discipleship. You've not been taking time in devotion. Maybe you need to repent of that sin because you have been missing out on God's will for your life. Just raise your hand and just repent this prayer. Dear God, I repent of not taking time in your word. Though the Holy Spirit is willing to reveal to me your will and your purpose for my life, but I've been outside of your will because I'm not taking time in the word. Give me the wisdom. Give me the diligence. Give me the discipline for personal study. Give me the discipline for getting into a Bible study. Give me the discipline for growing in discipleship that I may know the will of God and I may, I may fulfill it and that your kingdom may come in my very life. I pray this knowing I will lead a victorious life in 2021. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we take time now, um, I want to remind us to continue praying. As you can see, the prayer guide, I know you have copies on soft. And the rest of us who needed a hard copy, I know you have your hard copy. Please keep taking time to pray, to fast individually. Secondly, take time to pray together with the family through using the prayer guide. 
Thirdly, take time to come together. You know, when you pray for your house group in the evening, the group that is praying that day, and then on Thursdays, be ready to come together at church, those who can or those who are able, and we'll take time to just commit all the points we've been praying over to God because our God is able. Let's make time to pray. 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's 2021. Let's take time seeking the face of God. Let us wait on God. He never disappoints. Our God is with us. Our Lord Jesus Christ is with us. The Holy Spirit is guiding us. And this year shall be truly the year of the Lord's overcoming strength. God bless you as you serve him and as you take time to seek him in prayer and in study of the word. God bless you. Thank you.